there we go. Sorry about that remotely. Um, you didn't miss much, though. If you're watching from home, I was just talking about myself, and it's not that interesting. Uh, I was trying to do a little literary illusion here with the tale of two tokens and uh, Paris and France uh, from the from the book of the somewhat similar name. So, so in the beginning, there was something called SAML. Uh, SAML is the security assertion markup language. Uh, they actually decided to go with SAML because it sounded better than uh, SCUML, which would have been security claims markup language. Um, it's an XML-based framework for that allows identity and security information to be shared across security domains. Um, it's, it's primarily used for web single sign-on. Uh, there's varying levels of familiarity with it, but if you've ever used, you know, sign in with Facebook or sign in with Google or something like that, it SAML's sort of become the the enterprise grade version of that. What people use to do secure single sign on from one system and leverage that sign on onto other systems without having to reauthenticate every time and without forcing the proliferation of of creating new accounts and accounts with passwords at all these various other sites. Um, an assertion is sort of the, the fundamental construct of SAML. Like, like so many things, it's designed and layered, and it, it's a whole architecture. But the assertion is sort of the, the atomic unit. And it itself is a, a security token that allows these, this information to be, be exchanged. Um, it, it's usually signed, sometimes encrypted. Um, and it, it relies on XML digital signatures, which is another standard in order to do that, along with XML encryption, which itself is both out of the W3C uh, standards that allow for XML signatures and encryption. Um, SAML's developed sort of a, like I said, enterprise-y reputation. Um, the original designers had had great things and hopes for it that it would be applied to the consumer web as well, but it's largely become uh, sort of a rich man's solution. Um, largely only large enterprises are able to afford and, and deploy installations of it. Um, and it's something that a lot of companies do use, but but it hasn't gained sort of the widespread <laughs> adoption outside of sort of rich corporate corporate fortune, you know, 1,000 type companies. And uh, as I said, I work for Ping Identity, and it, it's really been paying my bills for about a decade now. I'm coming up on 10 years with Ping, and, and SAML's, SAML and developing SAML products is what has kept us in business for a long time. So it, it, it's been good to me. And it, it's been good to the company as a whole. Not only do we have... Uh, have our company that we do a business around SAML. We've also developed uh, some conferences, one of which was uh, the Cloud Identity Summit. And a year and a half ago, in the summer, we uh, we had a good time. Uh, we, we're we're a fun-loving company. We do a lot of things, and we've been lucky enough to make some good money off of SAML. But during the conference a year and a half ago, Craig Burton, who uh, is self-described as what did he say here? Self-described again as one of the leading visionaries and analysts in the computer industry. Uh, came out and said at our very own conference that SAML is dead. Um, and there was some mixed reaction to this, mostly from colleagues of mine who, who like me, <laughs> um, you know, pull our paycheck from, from SAML. We're a little bit concerned about the implications of this. And, uh, you know, there was some clarification that was offered. Uh, one of the quotes that I liked is uh, that SAML is the Windows XP of identity. Uh, no funding, no innovation. No innovation. No, people still use it, but it has no future. So the, the point they were trying to make was not that it's necessarily bad, not, not that there's anything wrong with it, but that, that the, the times are sort of moving beyond it. Um, this guy, uh, Dave Krusty Curmudgeon, Curmudgeon Kearns, uh, didn't actually say that. He quoted his colleague Burton, but I really wanted to use Krusty Curmudgeon. Uh, on a slide, so I included him here. And, and he did write a blog about it. So, you know, I was thinking, I, I've got 29 years of mortgage payments left and, and two kids in private school, so maybe I better find out if SAML is dead, what, what the future really is. Um, and to be fair, I, I do take some issue with, with what Burton said about SAML being dead. I, it, this particular statement is maybe more along the lines of what's accurate. It, it's still widely deployed, still in use. People are investing in it. People are going forward with it. But, but there is emerging work coming along that I think over time and a longer horizon will will maybe eclipse it or at least lessen its importance overall. So even though you know death is is bad, sometimes interesting, it, it brings opportunities. Um, a lot of the same people that were involved in the development SAML or or at least in the 
in the deployment and usage of it over time are also involved in development of newer standards that are coming along. And it, it gives the opportunity to do some things better. When you're solving the same problem the second time, uh, oftentimes you get an opportunity to look at it in a little bit different way, learn things from past mistakes, or learn things that you weren't aware of through the course of that. And I, I think there's a, there's a real opportunity here to develop things that are easier to use and that, and that work better. And so some of the things I want to talk about are those, those standards. There's actually quite a bit of work going on right now uh, at a lot of different layers throughout the, the various protocol stacks of identity and various other things. But I'm going to focus specifically on, on these four items, which are the, the JSON Web Token, uh, the JSON Web Signature, JSON Web Encryption, and JSON Web Key, which are sort of the, the lower layer fundamental building blocks of a lot of other work that's going on right now. Um, and these have been uh, accused of being called JW star. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the, the WS star sort of series of specifications. It's, it's been a little bit maligned, and, and people are not real happy about it. So I always, I always hear JW star and think of it as sort of an insult. So I, I was looking at the algorithm soup that make up the JW star specifications. And in addition to the four that I mentioned here, they also break out the algorithm specification, which is JWA. Um, to sort of define and allow for algorithm agility into these different specifications, I noticed that that spells JW steak. So I'm trying to push JW steak instead of JW star because you know a nice good steak sort of has a, a better connotation. Um, so I'm going to jump into some of those, and, and it, it, it's sort of a minor thing, but one really useful change that people have made is in, in how they encode binary data or data that's not not necessarily safe for a lot of different transports and. Uh, SAML and a lot of the other types of protocols like that and WS, WS Security use base 64 URL encoding, or excuse me, base 64 encoding. Um, and, and these newer versions, JWS and JWE, as well as JWK, all use base 64 or URL encoding, which they're both very similar. Um, and if you're not familiar with them, they're both a means of encoding binary data into ASCII string format. Um, if you've ever gotten, if you've ever seen like a MIME attachment, you'll see a bunch of characters along the bottom. That's basically Base64 encoded binary data. So it's a way to represent binary data using just string characters. Um, each six bits of binary data is encoded into one of those 64 characters. Um, and then basically what you end up with is every three bytes of data ends up being encoded in, in four characters. So Base64 URL is, uh, is the same as Base64, but it uses a URL safe alphabet rather than the nearly URL safe alphabet of regular Base64. Uh, the 64 characters are made up of um, the alphanumerics, capital and lowercase, as well as numbers. And then for URL, it uses the dash rather than the plus, underscore rather than the slash. And they usually admit padding. So regular Base64 is padded usually at the end with, with um, equal signs. And these three characters then aren't URL safe. They, they require encoding if they're going to be passed around in, in URLs and so forth. And so it seems like sort of a minor thing, but, but the use of a, a URL and safe encoding scheme means that no encoding is ever applied when you, when you transport these things over the web, via redirects or in headers or whatever, um, which, which does keep them smaller, which is nice. And it also prevents a lot of, a lot of funky errors with double encoding or, or decoding once or twice or not enough times that, that sort of crop up. So um, it's a, it's a tiny little thing, and I had never actually heard about it until some of these came along. But it, it turns out to be a really, really useful, useful change in the way some things are done. And there's one remaining, actually, I think there's a couple, but there's a main remaining unreserved URI character that's safe that doesn't require encoding, and that's the period character. And this will prove uh, important very shortly. Well, the first, uh, first main emerging standard I want to talk about is JSON Web Signature. And this is a, a standard that's being developed. Actually, all the standards I'm going to talk about tonight are being developed within the IETF. Um, there's a working group there, and they're sort of in progress. Uh, this is one of them, this is sort of the, the first one, the more stable one, and um, uh, probably the, the simplest to understand, at least initially. And it, it's a way of representing content secured with a digital signature or a MAC, a message authentication code. Um, and it uses da JSON data structures uh, and Base64 URL encoding to sort of represent all this data. And then it, en it encodes segments with JSON or the actual binary, Base64 encoded, and then concatenates the different segments together with a period character. So the period is, is a character that's not used in Base64 URL, but is web safe. 
So you get you still get a web safe object, and then the, these different components of it are easily delimited by the period character that can be broken apart. Um, it's really intended for sort of space constrained environments such as AT HTTP authorization headers or oftentimes URI query parameters passing around using on the web. So it's going to be small, but it's also web safe in terms of the character set used. And it, it's conceptually really simple. When you see a, a JWS, and I'll, I'll have an actual example here shortly, but it, it amounts to the header, which will be a base64 encoded JSON, which represents the header, dot payload, dot signature, where each of those, each of those components are, are encoded in the, the uh, excuse me, the dot separates them. The actual header itself is how you describe sort of what's going on with this particular object. Uh, it's a, a bit, usually very small bit of JSON that describes how the digital signature of Mac was applied and maybe some other meta information about it itself. Um, there's a couple of reserved header names. And keeping with the theme of trying to keep things relatively small, they've, they've gone with using three-letter, uh, three-letter, not necessarily acronyms, but trying to three-letter short names for all the headers. So ALG is the algorithm that the signature was applied with. And there's HMAC algorithms, RSA algorithms, and elliptic curve digital signature algorithms that are available. There's a, there's a none algorithm, which is basically saying no actual signature was applied to this, which is a little bit of a, a controversy right now, whether that will be approved or not. Um, you know, it's like a null cipher suite, which can be really useful sometimes, but has, has also been the cause of, of some problems when people don't realize they're enabling systems and that have these, these sort of null operators for cryptographic out information. It's also extensible, um, although you know, they've probably covered most of the, the important ones right now. If, if tomorrow somebody brilliant comes up with a, you know, a new and better public key scheme and signature scheme, uh, this stuff could be extended to accommodate that. Um, there's a bunch of other header values, one of which is my favorite is the kid or key ID, which is really it's just a key name. It's, it's an opaque value. It's not necessarily any semantic defined to it, but it's a way to signal which key was used. I'll talk about that a little bit more later in detail. But you can also um, indicate sort of a URL where you might host your public keys, either in uh, JWK format, which I'll also talk about in a bit, or in uh, X509 format. Um, you can indicate a certificate thumbprint, say, you, to signal which key was used. Most, most of the other meta information is about signaling to the recipient of the message which key was used to actually sign it so they know how to verify it uh, appropriately. Excuse me. Um, it's a little hard to read there. Sorry about that. But um, So one the specific example of a header sort of translating English into this JSON is, say I wanted to, to send a, a JWS message to someone and I was going to, I'm going to say, I, I signed this thing, this object, I signed it with RSA SHA-256. And I used a, a key that you and I both know as uh, by the name of Niner, because that's a funny little name I like. And you can find that, actually, you can find that corresponding public key at this particular HTTPS URL. And so that end up, ends up looking like just ALG, RSA-256, KID, Niner, and JWK uh, with a HTTPS URL there pointing to an example URL. Some of the, I won't go into all these in detail, and I just copied it from the spec, but the actual algorithms defined by JWS, actually by JWA, A, the algorithm spec, once again, to sort of allow for agility if, if new ones need to be coming along, or they can update required or necessary algorithms independent of the core specification. But you can see there's various strengths of HMAC, various strengths of RSA, and actually two different kinds of RSA, as well as various strengths of uh, elliptic curve algorithms, and then, of course, the uh, the fun little nun one there. Although it's, it's actually really useful in some applications. It's just people need to be careful with how they implement it or use it. So to try to um, kind of bring it all together, here's a, an actual example of what a, a JWS would look like. So as I said before, I'm from the, the Denver office of Ping Identity. And I come up here a lot uh, from the Canadian office. And we have a little bit of a rivalry going on. I like to throw Canadian jokes into my presentations, which seemed a little I wasn't sure about it for this audience, but I went ahead with it anyway. So the, the message that I want to secure is USA number one. And a lot of you might want to change that. So I definitely want to place a digital signature on it and protect it. So there's my message and my payload. The first thing I do when creating this JWS, this message that we're going to protect with the digital signature, is encode the payload. 
So the base64 URL encoding of that looks like that. You know, it's a, a string of characters, but, but that's how it's encoded. And then I, I produce my header to sign this, and I want to sign this one with elliptic curve digital signature using the uh, P256 curve and SHA-256, and these things are, are defined. So that one maps to a very short name of ALG equals ES-256, and that's sort of a shorthand version to, to reference that particular type of signature. I base 64 UN code URL encode, <coughs> excuse me, all of that to produce the encoded header. And then I apply the signature to the concatenation of the encoded header dot using that separator and the payload together. So that's the input to the signature, which produces the, it's actually the, the bytes behind that, the octets behind that. But that, that's the input into the signature, which produces an actual signature value, which again is base64 URL encoded. And then appended to the end, it's getting smaller here with the text, but with another dot character appending that on the end. And you can sort of conceptually think about this as, you know, header, payload, signature. And the encoding is there both to provide for sort of safety and transport, as well as provide sort of what I, what I call sort of a poor man's version of canonicalization. So if you're going to sign something, you need to make sure that the verifier is, is verifying the same set of bytes that you signed. This has been a real big problem with XML signatures, even though there's a, there's a definition of, of how to canonicalize data so the same sort of semantically meaning XML document should canonicalize to the same content no matter what. In, in practice, it, it's very fragile and it doesn't work very well. Um, and so what I think very wisely, what the people with, with have done with the, uh, all this is, sorry, quick diversion. All this is happening underneath the Jose working group in, uh, in the IETF. So if you hear me ha say Jose, it's sort of a blanket term for that. Um, they like their sort of cute, funny little names, and it stands for JavaScript Object Signing and Encryption, but it's Jose. So, But uh, wisely, the Jose group decided to not try to define a canonical form of JSON, because it, it's very, very difficult. Different parsers uh, do things differently the way that sort of number precision is done makes it makes it really hard to actually get to a single canonical format. So they said, no, screw it. We're not going to do that at all. What we're going to do is just take whatever the actual content was, base64 URL encode the whole thing, and that itself becomes sort of a, a lazy way of doing canonicalization. So I know the signature was calculated over over this piece, and it it I know that it was transported to you in that same fashion hasn't been changed because it, there's no sort of differential meaning the way there is in, in JSON or, or XML. So it makes it really easy to ensure that, that I'm signing the same data that you're ver verifying, um, which is which has been, a, I, I think, has already shown its, its worth and sort of increased interoperability and a lot less troubleshooting. I've spent a lot of time at Ping troubleshooting XML digital signature problems, which are, are brutally difficult to, to troubleshoot um, and deep in, in library code that I don't understand very well. And it usually ends up being some oddity of some character or some namespace treatment that just some esoteric thing. And, and not having to even worry about that is really nice. The other sort of class of messages that, that the Jose Working Group has defined is JSON Web Encryption, which you'll hear people say a lot is JWE. Uh, it's really similar in motivation and design to JWS. You know, it's, it's meant to be relatively small. It gets a little bit bigger, but intended to be small, used for space-constrained environments, um, using an entirely web-safe alphabet. Uh, it's, a, it's slightly more complicated because even though you wouldn't think it is, encryption, the, the necessary steps of doing encryption in the right way are a little bit more complicated than signatures. Um, the ALG header, the algorithm header, is used here as it is in JWS except here it's used to represent the, the key wrapper key agreement algorithm. So it, it signifies how the two parties are going to agree on the actual content encryption key. And then the ENC header, the encryption method header, uh, defines the actual authenticated encryption, content encryption scheme that was used. So there's sort of two stages of that. First is the key agreement. Sim similar to how you might uh, agree on a, a session key for SSL or something like that, you agree on a a content encryption key, even though it's one-time use in the message, you still do it with another key in order to agree on the, the symmetric content encryption key. And you can also apply a compression algorithm to JWE. Um, and there's a bunch of other ones. But for the most part, they're similar in content to the JWS ones. These are the ones that are treated differently. But there's a bunch of headers that allow for key identification. 
Um, instead of three parts like in JWS, it's five parts, but it's the same kind of thing. The encoded header, the encrypted key is separately encoded and included um, there, the initialization vector, the actual ciphertext, and then an authentication tag at the end. And real quickly, I want to touch again on the, that all of the algorithms defined for JWE are um, authenticated encryption algorithms. So there's been some recent problems discovered. I think there always have been, but they've come to light more. Problems with like basic block modes of ciphers like AES, CBC has be become somewhat vulnerable to a lot of padding oracle attacks and things like that. And um, Authenticated encryption is, is one way to thwart that. It actually gives a lot of other, other um, benefits, but start of st the, having the benefit of starting later, all of the JWE algorithms either are authenticated encryption algorithms or they've created their own sort of composite authenticated encryption algorithms behind the scenes. So regardless of, of which ones you use, you're gaining that benefit. Um, this is sort of an eye chart, but this is, uh, again, copied from the spec. These are the various different key management algorithms. Um, there's sort of the, the usual suspects, RSA and RSA OEAP. There's, um, there's AES, various strengths of AES, CBC to do key wrapping. So even, even if you share a symmetric secret, you can generate a random secret for the content encryption and wrap that with, with your current symmetric secret so it's not as, as uh, susceptible to various sort of crypto cryptanalysis and things like that, because you're not encrypting, you know, some sort of known or potentially known or, or text that might have patterns in it, you're encrypting a key with it. Um, despite that, though, there's also a direct mode, so if we have a shared key, we can use that directly to encrypt the content, and the, uh, like, the encrypted key will be admitted in that case. Uh, different, different value for different use cases, but a lot of different options there. There's a uh, elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman, um, imperial static, Thank you. Modes, so uh, for elliptic curve keys, you can do a uh, key agreement, which then can also be either used directly as the content encryption key, or itself can be used then, the, key, the agreed upon key can be used to wrap a, a, a random key used for content encryption. And then there's a bunch of AES GCM algorithms that have um, integrated content uh, integrity protected protection in them. Um, and there's also some password-based encryption algorithms that are I, I think meant for, they're not meant for sort of uh, the same type of usage that you would get from AES or something, but they're there to do password-based encryption uh, more to maybe protect keys on file systems or, or things like that, but also sort of give the, the ability that this can be used for a lot of different things. It's really meant to be uh, a message-oriented encryption protocol, but it can also be used to, to encrypt files locally or, or do a lot of different things, so it, it has some versatility. Um, and then once you've established the key via one of those many mechanisms, then there's the actual content encryption algorithms. This, this chart's a little bit smaller. There's three different strengths of AES CBC and three different strengths of uh, AES GCM. And so GCM has in in, excuse me, integrated um, authentication and integrity protection. AES CBC does not. So what's been defined here is actually a composite algorithm that combines AES CBC with HMAC, HMAC2 SHA. So um, you get, using the, the HMAC as well as the, the cipher, you get a, a, an authenticated encryption scheme. Basically, you, you guarantee the integrity of the cipher text, which protects against things like chosen plain text attacks, or excuse me, chosen cipher, cipher text attacks that oftentimes you don't get in normal applications of AES CBC. So, um, you know, one area you see a lot is people might, be trying to decide whether to roll, roll their own encryption scheme. And while no one actually ever rolls their own encryption anymore, so that's probably not true, no one should. Um, even using, you know, well-understood and well-defined sort of cryptographic primitives can be problematic these days because there are, there are attacks on plain CBC that a lot of people don't know about. Even I didn't know about until recently. Um, but if you go ahead and use, use the Jose layer stuff to do the encryption, you get some of that, some of that sort of mind share for free by, by ensuring that no matter which of these you choose, whatever your platform supports, you get that authenticated encryption. So this one's tough, but we're going to walk through a quick example of uh, JWE. So turns out I actually really like Canna, as much, uh, much crap I give it here, but I don't want everyone to know that. So the, the payload here that I want to protect is I actually really like Canada. Um, but again, I, I can't let everyone know that, so I'm going I'm to encrypt that with JWE. 
the first thing that I do, again, is, is produce my header. Um, in this case, I've decided to use uh, Liquid Curve Diffie-Hellman with uh, an AES-128 key wrap. So I, I place that um, as the algorithm value. After that key has been, and so in that case, we're, we're going to do a Diffie-Hellman key agreement negotiation and then produce a shared secret from that and use that to, wrap, to, to encrypt a random key. That's the AES part. And once we have that key, then we're going to use the composite AES HMAC algorithm here, AES-128, CBC, HMAC SHA-250 v6. And part of the elliptic curve key agreement is it's, uh, it's an ephemeral static key agreement. So this assumes that I have the message recipient's public elliptic curve key. And in order to do the agreement, I'm going to generate an ephemeral key, a one-time key. And using his public and my private, I, I can do a key agreement, and he can get agree to the same key using his private and my public, and then I can throw this away. But I have to send him the public key as part of the agreement. So uh, in a format that's a little unclear because I haven't touched on it yet, but we include a, a JWK, which is actually a, a public key encoded in JSON here, to, to indicate my public key that's being used as part of this agreement. It's a little bit bigger, but it, it's still relatively small because it's elliptic curve. Uh, base64 base URL encode that header. Looks like that in the green. I take the encrypted key, which is the key that was encrypted, was randomly generated and encrypted using the result of that Diffie-Hellman agreement. And base64 URL encode that. That's the purple piece. Uh, randomly generate 128-bit initialization vector. Um, and then apply the cipher, the ASCBC cipher to the plain text. Base64 URL encode that. That's the blue part. Um, I produce the authentication tag, which is a left truncated half of the SHA-256 HMAC um, produced over the encoded header, the IV, and the ciphertext. That gives me this, and then I smash them all together again with periods, which is kind of the, the root piece of this. So I have my header, my encrypted key, my initialization vector, of ciphertext, and the authentication tag, and it's a little lost down here, but it, it looks similar to the one we had before, just these, these three different, um, excuse me, five different pieces of base64 URL encoded data uh, concatenated together with the dot separator. So building on top of, of these two concepts is something called a, a JSON web token. Um, for reasons that are still not entirely clear to me, the suggested pronunciation of JSON web token isn't JWT, but it's JOT. Uh, it's even written in the spec. I, I still don't know the origin of that, but and I'm still not sure I do it all the time, so I might, may say them interchangeably, but JOT's what it's supposed to be. Uh, we've said this before, it's compact, it's URL safe, and it's a means of representing claims to be transferred between two parties. And really, all a, a JOT or JWT is, is it's a JWS or a JWE, but specifically with a set of JSON claims as the payload of that object. And claims are, to it, it's a term that's sort of wave back and forth, but it's, it's what Microsoft largely uses to, to, to talk about sort of claims about attribute information. Uh, in the SAML world, they're attributes, but generally claims are things about a person or things about the actual object itself. Um, I say that here too, but it, it, a JW, JWT claim is a, it's a piece of information that the sender of the message, the creator of this JOT message, is asserting about a subject or sometimes about the actual message itself. Um, and these claims are just represented as JSON. Uh, the, the claim has a name, and then the value of the claim can, can be any JSON object. It's generally a string, but it can, in fact, be a full object underneath. Um, the JOT specification is extensible. You can use whatever claims you want. Um, there's some ways you're supposed to register them, use URIs or whatever. You really can do whatever you want. Uh, but it does define some commonly used claims that will be applicable in a lot of different scenarios. Uh, one is the issuer, so who, how do you identify the person that actually sent the message, both so you know who it came from and, and you can figure out sort of appropriate keying material. The subject, um, the audience, so who is the message for. Uh, in a lot of protocols that use these kind of security tokens, you need to identify whom the token is tended, intended for for consumption so that it can't be used to access some other party for whom it wasn't intended. And these are largely bearer tokens, so there has to be some way of, of asserting that and checking it, and the audience is used for that. Um, there's an expiration time. Uh, there's a not before, so you can't use this token prior to, although that doesn't get used very much. There's an issue at time, and there's also just a, a general identifier for it. Um,
It's a joke. I don't know. <laughs> Got laughs last time. So here's an actual jot. Um, it, this is just a JWS, but it has the payload of some actual clamps. So what this is saying is this token was issued by you know, whoever, IDP, identity provider, dot example, dot com. It expires at, at such and such time. So it also defines a time for, format, a really simple time format that's just the number of seconds from the epic, which makes it pretty easy to deal with. You don't have to worry about time zones or, or time format con constructs or anything like that. It's saying that the audience of this token, this token is intended for and only to be accepted by sp.example.org, which is parlance we use in, in this world, which is just a service provider, someone who's relying on this authentication. Uh, it has an identifier, which is just sort of long, meaningless, sort of a GUID, if you will. Um, ACR is a way to say what, what the means of authentication was or sort of a, uh, an assurance level, if you will. It, it's really just sort of an open-ended field that you can put a string value in, but in this case I'm using an example which is sort of like a level of assurance value saying that, that the issuer has a, a level of assurance of two that I am who I say I was when I authenticated. And the subject is me, Brian. Um, so that, that the actual payload is once again base64 URL encoded placed in the middle of the, the object. And the header I put on this is signed with elliptic curve 256. And I'm saying I signed it with a, a key that, that I identify w by the number 5. It's just the key ID for it. And the signature is just the, the octets of the signature that are encoded. One real value of, of the jot over SAML is, is the size of it. So I, I produced two different tokens that say they're not identical, but pretty much semantically are equivalent. They, they're asserting the same claims. They have the same sort of level of protection in terms of the, the, um, the signature that's placed on them. And in the bottom here is a SAML assertion in XML signed with an XML digital signature. And on the top is a JOT. And you can see the difference in terms of, of the size of these and what it might take to be able to transport them and encode them. And to make it even worse, the JOT itself is is URL safe. It can be transferred without any additional encoding. And usually for SAML to be transferred somewhere, it needs to additionally be base64 URL, or excuse me, base64 encoded, which uh, will expand it significantly. But it's not just the size. Um, there's a lot of value in being simple. So a lot of times security problems, vulnerabilities come from overly complex systems that we don't understand. And so simple oftentimes is better. I talked a little bit earlier about um, how we avoided can canonicalization in doing this stuff. Um, also that there's a web safe encoding, but a sort of a byproduct of using base64 URL is that that's used as sort of the poor man's canonicalization method. And while it doesn't give you the same kind of features that, that you might have gotten with the regular canonicalization, it works, it's a lot simpler, it has a lot less interoperability problems, and it turns out that that simplicity leads to a lot better security. So there's entire classes of very serious attacks that were prevalent on SAML and on the underlying structure of XML digital signature that just aren't applicable here. I mean, they're just things that have come out year after year and announcement after announcement, some that are really serious, like XSLT transform attacks that are a lot of times denial of service, but they also had remote code execution on certain platforms. So there were, there were attacks where you could systems that were expecting these, these XML messages, you could send them an XML message and crash the entire system or, or in some cases execute code based on the content of that message on that system, uh, which is bad. Um, there were some uh, canonicalization hash collisions uh, where some canonical algorithms allowed for comments to be included, some didn't, and if you had the comment type, you could you can insert a lot of, lot of content that was semantically unimportant to the message because it's just a com comment, but could, could aid an attacker in trying to produce hash collisions. Um, there's entity expansions attacks, so the so-called million laugh attack, where you have a DTD that expands sort of recursively and infinitely. Uh, so one message can sort of consume an entire node processing. Um, XPath, transform, and even bypass, where you bypass the signature entirely. External references, where uh, references within messages would be dereferenced and pulled down and various things could happen. Um, and signature wrapping attacks, which uh, actually based on some research that a colleague of mine in the audience here did uh, that we were doing at work, um, I took some of his work and I looked at it and I thought this is probably applicable elsewhere. And I'm not, I do a lot of work 
for application development and security work, but I'm not really a security guy. I'm certainly not a hacker, but I was able to turn around using this exploit and hack into um, Google Apps, switching identities. And this, uh, this poor bastard right here is a coworker of mine. Um, I logged into an e his email address using, using an assertion generated by our system. I went in and I, I applied a signature wrapping attack to bypass, not really bypass authentication, but escalate my privileges to access his account. And so these are all things that have plagued sort of XML-based security frameworks that just by the very nature of the way that signatures are calculated with Jose, JWT, JWT, et cetera, JW stake, excuse me, um, they're not even applicable. So they, they don't even come into, into a possibility, which is awfully nice. Now, that's not to say there's not some new classes of attacks, some new things that we don't know about, but, but and, and probably there will be things that emerge over time, but generally it's so much simpler that I, I think it'll be, be more secure over time. One last, um, I think we're getting to the end here, sorry, uh, piece of, of the, the JW stake stack that, that I think is really promising is uh, JSON web key or JWK. And really all it is is a JSON data structure that represents a cryptographic key or a set of keys. Um, they, can, they can be symmetric keys. They can be public keys. They can be public and private keys together. Uh, and they're all useful, but probably the most useful piece is representing public keys as just JSON. So a lot of times, at least in our industry, what we see people doing is using certificates as a, a means of encoding and transferring public keys because it's really convenient. There's a lot of tooling and a lot of support for parsing and sending certificates and it, it's a nice canonical form. But, but most people are just dealing with self-certifying certificates in a lot of cases and they don't need all the metadata and all the, all the certification that goes along with that. And uh, a JWK is a nice alternative to that. So it's just a, it's, it's a little piece of JSON that represents a public key, any key, but a lot of times public key. Uh, you can include it directly in a header of one of the other objects we've looked at. Uh, there was one example of that with the ephemeral public key used for key negotiation. But you could also include a, you know, other use cases where you actually include the signing key or whatever. You can just save it in a file, send it in an email. I mean, be careful, but it, it's nice. You don't have to worry about the encoding. Um, they can be used in a lot of places in, in place of where you might have otherwise used self-signed certificates, particularly as tooling evolves for this stuff and it becomes easier to work with and easier to use. Um, one area that I think is really interesting is you can publish these in an HTTPS endpoint and reference them with the key ID header in your messages. Um, so one area that's, that's been really problematic in actual deployments of SAML type systems is key maintenance with partners. Everybody gets going, we exchange our certificates in order to sign and verify the messages, and everybody's happy until a year later when the certificates expire. And then we have to get people on the phone and, and deal with rolling them over. And, and it's, it's nothing that can't be dealt with, but operationally it becomes a challenge, particularly as you scale out to larger and larger numbers of partners. So a strategy that, that's maybe, I hope, going to catch on a little bit is rather than doing that certificate exchange, you maintain your own certificate for your HTTPS endpoint, which, which needs to be verified, needs to authenticate to who your server is. But then you publish and, and rather often rotate keys you use to sign and encrypt data. So if I was going to send a message that I've signed, I would actually use a so not really ephemeral, but sort of short-lived key where I pu publish the public version of it at an endpoint, send it to somebody else. You can come back to my HTTPS endpoint, verify that it is in fact me doing uh, you know, server authentication at that point, and use the key ID to dereference which key in this file to actually verify it with. Um, and then over time, the keys in this file can rotate. I can issue new keys, give it a new ID here. I mean, I've got four, five, six, seven. They can be some sequence or, or, or whatever, however you want to identify them. Um, issue a new key, publish it out here, and a, a receiver of these messages could, could easily recognize and cache this data, but recognize when a new, header, a new key ID has been sent to them and just go out and refetch public keys. And what you get from that is sort of a, a no-touch or a much lower-touch way to rotate keys. You still have to rotate your, your TLS certificate, but that's sort of the only piece you have to do, and that doesn't require any manual negotiation with any of your partners. So that was sort of the, uh, the, the baseline sort of quick introduction to the, the lower-level protocols of, of 
I'm really going to try to drive this home, to JW Stake, um, to the Jose work. And what's nice about these is they, they provide some sort of low-level primitives that are composable and reusable in, in various different contexts. And they're being reused right now. They're being used in different places. Um, there's different applications of them in OAuth. Uh, they can be used as access tokens. There's ways to exchange a sort of a signed jot for an access token. Uh, they're being used throughout OpenID Connect as sort of the, the assertion format. So what OpenID Connect is the next generation of OpenID. It's sort of very similar to SAML in a lot of respects, but it, it needs a signed security token, optionally encryption, that could pass between two parties. And Connect is using, um, using Jose for that token. Uh, Mozilla Persona is using, uh, I think, different portions of, I believe, actually, all three different pieces, or at least JWS and JWT. I heard you talking about that earlier today. I think there's some uh, some version compatibility that hopefully it can get reconciled over time. Yeah, um, and yeah. And speaking of spinalism, and, and a lot more. So not only are they being used in, in various protocols, I think there's a lot of applications where they can be useful just in, in sort of proprietary or internal usages. We're developing a product right now. Actually, we just released recently a product that uses a uses a JOT as the actual session token. So it allows information uh, around a, a session to be stored securely, but keeps all the state off of the server. Um, and it, it, there's a lot of other applications I think over time will become really useful and provides a relatively easy sort of programming API into doing this. Um, so speaking of finalization, these are, I hope, approaching finalization as RFCs. Uh, I always get nervous when I say that because I've I've stood in front of people and said, this will be standardized by the end of the year. And then two years later, I'm saying, this will be standardized by the end of the year. Um, but I, I have a pretty good feeling that, that maybe springtime, these will be published as actual RFCs. And that'll hopefully eliminate some problems. Like Mozilla is using it, but it's, it's usually in an earlier draft. So there's potentially some incompatibility there, which isn't really problematic until you want to be able to have widespread reuse of, of various libraries and things. Um, but these are the current drafts, so the IETF numbers are drafts. These are the current ones at, at the time that I wrote this. There'll probably be a, a, couple, but a couple more, but hopefully there's, there's no more sort of breaking changes coming, and they've been stable for quite some time. Um, and there's a lot of community interest around this. So I just did a, a, it's certainly not exhaustive, but I tried to list out a bunch of different implementations that I know about from various ways, things I've heard about. Um, there's one in Java. There's actually a couple in Java. I only listed one here because it's mine, so I didn't want to. I didn't want to give the competition any uh, any sort of screen time. But there's Java, Ruby. There's several in JavaScript, both for um, running in browser as well as ports to Node. Um, there's a couple in Perl. There's Python, PHP, and .NET. I'm sure there's more. This is just sort of a partial list. But what I think it shows is you know, a lot of sort of community support and interest in producing reusable componentry and libraries for this stuff. Um, and again, real quickly, you know, I, I, haven't, I haven't even looked at some of these. I've used, uh, I've used one of the JavaScript ones. This one's pretty cool. And you can go ahead and it, it has like online tools that you can just play around with and verify and create. But I haven't actually used the, any of the rest of them. So this is certainly not an endorsement of any of these other than my own, of course. Um, but, but just a starting place. If you're interested in looking at this, um, a place you could go to look uh, for various implementations on different platforms. And along with the simplicity of sort of the overall model, I, I think that these imply a relatively simple sort of programming interface, which is nice. Um, I was looking at I, I, some of the examples I had earlier. I generated myself, because they're real examples. They're, they're verifiable. And I, I generated them using my own code. I looked back and realized that those each only took a few lines of code each. So, so this top piece here was used to generate the, uh, the JWS example. It's my USA <coughs> right there. And the bottom one was used to, to produce the, uh, the JWU example. So each one of them is, is only a tiny little bit of code. And it gives an idea of, um, of the relative simplicity of using this stuff relative to, to trying to, to put together some of these primitives on your own. And uh, then I got my URL here to my package. And in case you missed it on the last slide, uh, it's available there if you want to go take a look. And so that's all I've got for tonight. Um, talking a little fast. Sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. But I really appreciate everybody coming out and uh, giving a listen.
and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions now from the group, or if you want to grab me later, uh, more than happy to. Yeah? Uh, okay, I missed the beginning, but what was the reason for trying to get some pack and out of like, the San Juan pump space? Uh, was there performance? Was that a primary reason? There's, so the, the question was, I uh, missed the beginning, and um, wanted to know what, what some of the motivating factors for trying to, to bring down the size was. Was it performance or, or otherwise? Um, there's actually a number of motivating reasons. One is that um, SAML's big, I mean relatively big, big enough that people have struggled when they try to use it as like a, an HTTP header. It, it doesn't work. It's oftentimes exceeded. Um, exceeded size limitations of various pieces in the, in the stack. So that was one, trying to get it down. Um, in SAML, when, when you do a, a message exchange between two parties, you have to somehow direct the user agent from one, play, one server to the other. Um, and, and often that's done with just with a redirect. But in the, for the most part, a SAML assertion and all the other stuff that goes with it exceeds URL length limitations. So it ends up needing to be done with like a form auto post all of which work. I mean, there's, there's nothing that, that doesn't work. But when you when you shrink the token significantly, and and really significantly, it, it gives you a lot more flexibility in what you can do. So you, these tokens can be passed around used as headers. They can be used as OAuth tokens, which are passed as headers. Um, they're more likely to be able to be be passed via non-post simpler means between different parties. And then also the encoding doesn't. The, the way the token, the character set the token uses doesn't require any additional URL encoding. Um, and I think, I think efficiency is a, a partial motivation, too. I mean, it helps if it's a little bit smaller. It's fewer bytes. It's less stuff to process. Um, but probably wasn't the, the main motivating factor. More of the motivation around size was what you could do with it, how you could transport it on the wire, and so forth. Yeah. Um, so I understand that. It's a question specific to your company, actually, but oh. uh, with uh, XS, LT, and SAML kind of becoming kind of uh, old in a sense, um, and this protocol not being exactly uh, finalized as a standard, are you guys still actually transitioning your existing customers over to this, or is there any sort of upgrade path for them, or what's happening exactly with that? There's, there's definitely not a transition or an upgrade plan. In fact, we we plan to sort of run in, in a multi-mode for, for a long, long time. Um, so our we're, we're still working on the newer stuff, um, and we have some support for it now around the... Uh, I think it was the spring of this year, we released sort of uh, the identity provider, the asserting party side of the OpenID Connect stack, which used my Jose library underneath to do the token signing. But I was real careful to try to try to choose what I thought was going to be a, a stable sort of slice of the specification that wouldn't be subject to change. And there's uh, the Connect itself along with these, are, they're pushing to be ratified, so hopefully soon. And, and once that's done, we'll, we'll build out wider support. But ultimately, our product will will talk all the different protocols because I think they'll coexist for a long time, and it's certainly not the first time we've seen. They're not really protocol wars, but different different protocols sort of competing to do the same thing. And and our position has always been one of sort of neutrality and try to just support everything so you can you can talk to whatever you need to speak whatever protocol you need, and um, and that's where we're going to go with it at least for the the foreseeable future. There's certainly no plans to force anyone to change or even even necessarily recommend it. Um, you know, if something's working right now, stick with it. And then if, if you're bringing on new partners or new relationships, maybe consider which is better. Because there still will be benefits either way. I think it's also important to note that it comes down to what service providers are using as well, right? At the end of the day, you have to talk SAML to your service provider. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly true. And that that's a big reason why we try to be multi-protocol, because most of the time you're I mean, it depends on who has the leverage in the relationship. But usually, you want to connect to somebody. Yeah, they say, <laughs> they say we we talk X, we talk SAML. So that's what we need to provide. And and there's not a lot of people right now that are doing Connect. I think it'll grow over time, and we'll want to be able to just provide both for everyone. It's only recently that service providers are starting to jump on the bandwagon, like, and yeah, that's from their customers pushing them. Yeah. yeah. And then the fact that everyone wants to be the IDP. There is a little of that. I mean, um, the, the there was a lot of interest in, in sort of becoming an IDP, being a general IDP, and no one, I think, really hit on a business model for that. Um, Facebook is proven why that doesn't really make you any money. 
Yeah, the I think I think there's some value in the bigger players doing it as a part of their whole offering to sort of help help retain users, you know, learn more about the users. But yeah, it creates an ecosystem that keeps people within their ecosystem. But as a pure play IDP, it, it's, it's just there hasn't been a lot of value for it. And a lot of it depends on the business context. A lot of people do want to be service providers. Uh, you know, one of the biggest sort of use cases that we see sort of the workplace to SaaS use case where um, companies are outsourcing some of their applications, some of their work. So, uh, you know, we personally use Gmail and, and Google Apps for a lot of our stuff, and we use SAML single sign-on so that we log on on our corporate system and do SAML out to, out to Google so we don't have to maintain another set of credentials and log on separately there. Do the same thing for, for Concur, for our re expense reporting for, I don't even use all of our SaaS apps, but sort of the, the workforce to SaaS workplace is, is really common and both at the behest of customers and just for their own sort of customer experience and retainment, there are a lot of companies that are um, either motivated to become or, or feeling pressure to become SPs now. What is one of the mandates here is that you're bringing Jot and everything down to more the consumer and small business as well as the enterprise. Enterprise gets sound. They always have. It's easy to get across. But you can't get those small businesses. They're always going to be saying, well, I'll use Facebook as my off because it's the easiest and it's the most common for the consumers. Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. I mean, there's there's definitely some... I see Facebook ever will have sound support. So that no, they never will. They never will. And so there's, there is some hope that this stuff will, will sort of democratize the technology a little bit. And there's actually been a lot of focus, not, not at this layer, but within the in the OpenID Connect layer, it's been mostly successful, but the focus has been to, to push the complexity onto the identity provider. The thinking being that, that the identity provider will either be big players like a Google or a Facebook that can figure it out and pay for it, or an enterprise that can buy software from a ping or something like that and simplify the work needed on the client side or the, the, the reliant party or service provider side that makes it easier for them to adopt adopt the technology. And I think I think for the most part they've been successful in doing that. They're making one assumption though. And the assumption is education, right? Like a small to medium player going directly to Facebook might be because they don't know these other options. So there's there's a piece there on educating people about what other options mm -hmm. are available to them as libraries for using Facebook. Yep. And some of that considering just the whether or not the small small to medium sized businesses are aware of it. You also have to understand the, the tools that they have in using them. So, uh, because small to medium sized businesses, when they choose Facebook, they're choosing it because their user base or their target customer base a Facebook user as opposed to business to business relationships within the company or, or uh, another company. I think that's that's definitely true. Also, although I, I mean, I would argue that in a lot of cases, it, it's preferable to use Facebook for authentication for a business like that than it would be to, to try to create and maintain their own password system. Yeah, face, it's Facebook. It, it's it is what it is, but it, it's still sort of they don't have to hold passwords. They don't have to maintain passwords. And it, it turns out that a lot of um, a lot of security breaches uh, and and like compromise of of things like accounts at Yahoo or at, at Google don't actually occur at Google, but they occur at the compromise of smaller systems like a, a small business that sets up their own site, doesn't really know how to protect things, and the fact that users use their Google email address and the same password at those sites. So if you can compromise this system, while it might not itself be a real high value target, a lot of times the credentials used there and stored there that you can access are, are valuable on actual high value targets. What kind of adoption are you seeing in the enterprise for It's coming along. It's slow. I, I think we're sort of in the phase where the the more savvy, not necessarily savvy, but the more cutting edge and more sort of early adopters are starting to really think about it and use it. Um, we've got uh, we we offer an OAuth authorization server, and we have a, a pluggable um, access token modules so you can either you can do different type of tokens and we've had a lot of requests for for using jot tokens as as access tokens um, so we've developed that and it's out there um, we have a few customers using open id connect um, it's still early but I, I think interest is to be totally honest i think a lot of people are interested in it because they hear about it and it's new 
and they're still in, we're still sort of in this phase of figuring out why you should be interested in it. Um, but I, I think there's good reasons to be, be interested in it. And, and over time, I think that'll sort itself out. But it's sort of, sort of early in, in education phase. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this, this may be a dumb question because I'm not an expert at this. No worries. But, uh, you talk about some of those reasons. And uh, this is the first talk I've heard about computer period where you haven't mentioned mobile. And it, is this have any advantages in the mobile world? Size being one. Um, Although I think it's it's a bit of a crutch argument that's not entirely true. People often talk about a mobile device, you know, having less less power than a a conventional device. Although to be fair, I mean, this thing outperforms the the laptop that I had five years ago. So I, I don't know how how real that is, but um, but yeah, I mean, just just being able to you know work in smaller bandwidth environments, which oftentimes is the case. Transferring this is going to be easier than this. Um, the fact that it, it, it's not, um, and actually elliptic curve algorithms, which are not necessarily unique to this, but I think is a chance for the industry as a whole to start moving more towards elliptic curve rather than RSA, are generally going to be more efficient, easier on the battery life and the, the processor power of mobile devices. Um, I didn't talk a lot about Connect or, or OAuth because I just wanted to keep it at the bottom layer, but those are sort of part of this group of emerging protocols. and. SAML really didn't, you could do some crazy things, but it didn't really have any story at all for, for functioning on a mobile device other than through the web browser. And Connect itself has ways that you can deliver sort of that authentication from, uh, you know, from a website, from a Facebook or a, a Google or whatever, down to an application on a mobile device. So they're not necessarily at this layer, but, but at layers that use some of this stuff do have a, a, a broader and a better story for mobile support. Does that help? <laughs> a little bit. Not a lot of specifics, but um, to to be fair, though, I don't think the mobile story is really answered with this stuff. Um, there's a there's a new working group actually forming right now in the uh, the OpenID Foundation that's that's being chartered basically to look at an improved single sign-on type experience specifically for mobile. And it'll probably build on top of Connect and other OpenID, and it'll use a lot of this stuff, but but is maybe one more step of work that needs to be done. So it's 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 better, but it's not there, and there's there's work being done in that area. Yeah. Um, all right. Thank you. So in your example, um, you use um, AES uh, symmetric with CBC, right? And then underneath that, you were using that two code. In the, in this one, actually. So underneath, I think of the stack a little bit different. So maybe a, it. My question wasn't about that. Okay. Just before I ask a question, I didn't like miss. No, uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, so um, how do you get around the thing of so the IB the um, that's just basic score encoded, right? Yeah. How do you get around the fact that that's not an ONS, It's not it's not rotated every time. Like, is is there is there a vulnerability by using CBC with a static IB? Yes. Um, classic kind of encryption uh, pitfalls. Yes. Um, so the the IV there is. I guess I didn't say it. It's randomly generated on every message. Oh, great. So that's part of the actual protocol. It will run. Yeah, yeah. It says it says to generate a, a unique and 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 so actually that's a good. I didn't say that as much in here. So, but yes. So even though I didn't say it, it's a it's a randomly generated and encoded. So it'll be different on each message. That takes care of that classic attack. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're following the protocol, you're good on that kind of attack. Um, I'm just if, thinking of like normally the places that. Myself and others fall down is implementation like the protocol that's implemented to you best in you know in, in the best way is awesome, but it's, if you know you give yourself guns to shoot yourself in these situations and if that's taken care of for you, that's, that's the point. Well, I, I think you're exactly right, and I, I maybe I didn't I didn't articulate it very well, but that's sort of what I was trying to say about you know there's a lot of all this all this really is is sort of a, a lumping together of of some cryptographic primitives in a way to use them, and. But a lot of people do that anyway, and a lot of people get it wrong. I've gotten it wrong myself. I've I've done encryption without a proper IV, and and so by even though this is maybe just a little bit of a layer above that, if you use these protocols, if you use libraries that implement protocols, you you take that sort of rope out of people's hand and, and don't let them hang themselves because it's already taken care of for them. So you're not actually giving them the option to do a fixed IV. No, it's just like 
it, it's mandated in the protocol, and at least in my library, it's it's abstracted away from you completely. You don't get a choice. It, it's it's a secure random generated IV on every message, and it just is. You have no no control over it. So like personally, from design, I've tried to, you know, give access to the things that that a that a user or client code would actually need to manipulate and work with, and information and want to know, and hide all the things that it it shouldn't know and shouldn't be able to muck with. And like even back to the yeah, it happens under where <laughs> under there and somewhere. But yeah, you don't deal with the IV and it, it's generated automatically for you. It's a good question though. And then I did just have another one. Um, you're talking about the the size um, comparison between uh, SAML and uh, JWT. JWT <laughs> Jot. <laughs> so, um, how does the parsing speed compare between? Uh, like index XML versus basic score I don't know. To be honest, I, I, I haven't done any kind of analysis. And I'm, there probably has been somebody that has, but I'm not aware of any. Yeah. Um, Obviously, in the OSI model, if, if passings, you know, <coughs> decrease, but like the network transfers better, then you get you put a battle there. Like, yeah. The, how it equates into the I, I don't know specifics. I mean, I, I'm sort of running off the naive assumption that, that smaller is better. Um, and that, that JSON parsers these days, and I mean, Base64 encoding is just a lookup table, so it's it's once over the data. That should be very fast, and, and JSON parsers these days are, are very good. So my assumption is it's a lot more more efficient, but I don't I don't have any hard evidence. I was just thinking, uh, if you get a particular JSON payload that's quite flat, I uh, wonder how that would compare to, you know, maybe uh, an XML payload that's quite structured and branched. It's a fair question. I don't know. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. Uh, I appreciate your coming. I appreciate all the uh, the detailed questions. I, I did put these slides up. Oops. Uh, there's a little URL to the slides available if you want to take a look, and I believe this will be. Um, yeah. Do you want to give yeah, any details? It's already been tweeted from my account. All right. It'll be up on the Obama Vancouver Wiki page uh, later on this evening or tomorrow morning. Great. Thank you.